Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Dealing with Conflict in the COVID-19 Era. My name is Gwen Dorsey, and I'm the Graduate Admissions Counselor for the Schools of Divinity, Counseling, and Social Work here at Karen University. It's my pleasure to introduce our faculty presenter for today's webinar. Dr. Lawrence Retzler is a faculty member in Karen University School of Social Work, and he currently serves as our new MSW program director. Dr. Ressler is a clinical social worker and trained mediator. For over 25 years, he has worked with families, churches, and organizations experiencing the destructive outcomes that can result from conflict. In today's webinar, Lawrence will discuss what conflict is, why change creates additional conflict, and what strategies parents, caregivers, and those in the social work field can use to manage it successfully. Before I turn things over to Lawrence, I wanna draw your attention to the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the webinar, you are welcome to submit any questions you have for Lawrence through the Q&A chat. And we will leave some time at the end to address as many of your questions as we can. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Lawrence. Thanks, Gwen, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to spend an hour with you to talk about something that's important to me and to all of us. Uh, it seems like we're in a, in a period of time where we have more than a usual amount of conflict and the tensions seem to be all around us and high. And I have been a, uh, Grew up in a, in a Christian family. My dad was a pastor, and so I attended church. Uh, you know, back in those days, you remember three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and, uh, and Wednesday, regularly. And so I was familiar with the, uh, you know, the Bible and, um, and understood that our, our, one of our things was to, uh, to be the, to follow the Prince of Peace. When I was about 11, I, uh, had a business and my business was to mow lawns. And so I had a customer, her name is Mrs. Pierce. So one day I took my lawnmower down to mow the grass and there was another boy mowing my grass. And I said to him, Mrs. Pierce is my customer and I know she paid me $5 every time to mow this grass. And he said, Mrs. Pierce is my customer. And I, and before I knew it, he drew back and hit me in the jaw with his fist and knocked me to the ground. What do you do? Well, I knew what to do. I was a Christian. I had already accepted Christ and I stood up and I turned my cheek and said, here, hit this side too. And he hit me second time and knocked me to the ground and I didn't know what to do. And I've been in an existential crisis and theological crisis ever since. What do you do when somebody hits you after you've turned the other cheek? Well, conflict is uh, something that I have been involved in for many years trying to understand. I was trained as a mediator when I was in my 20s and maybe for the first time I, I began to realize there are actually things we can do to be peacemakers. Uh, and so that's what I wanna talk a little bit about today is uh, just some, some basics about what I've uh, learned about conflict and what I would like you to think about. Such a complicated topic. And uh, so we won't be able to answer uh, the problems, but I'll be able to give you some ideas about maybe ways to look at conflict that maybe will be uh, helpful to you in whatever your situation is. Well, I'm going to uh, move to a PowerPoint uh, slides and show those and, and talk through those. And then we're going to go until about um, 40 minutes, and then we're going to stop and see if I can answer some questions that you may have. Uh, and if I can't answer them, Gwen is here. She'll answer them for you. <laughs> Okay, sure. uh, so let me, uh, let me go to my screen uh, and, uh, and bring this up and let's just see uh, some thoughts. I want to start with uh, three scriptures that are important to me uh, as we begin this, this conversation about conflict. Um, so one of them is one that I'm sure you're familiar uh, if you've been around uh, Christian faith at all in length of time. Matthew 5, 19 says, blessed are the peacemakers for they'll be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Wow, do we need peacemakers. We need them more now than ever as, uh, as families and as a country and as a world are filled with you know, the, the conflict that we have. 
that's always been really made worse by the COVID-19 things that have kind of turned everything upside down. So blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are you if you, uh, as you try to be a peacemaker in your own world. The second one is they must turn from evil and be good. They must seek peace and pursue it. And that's such an encouraging uh, and sobering verse to me because you can see that this is not something that's uh, once and done. This is seeking peace and pursuing it. And so I hope you join me in trying to understand how we can be peacemakers in a world so desperately needing peace, how we can pursue it and how we can understand it and begin to apply it. And the third one is a, a passage that sort of reminds us uh, to be realistic. If it is at all possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So you can see that this got a lot of qualifiers there, if it is possible. As far as it depends on you, live at peace. So what we can do is we can take responsibility for ourselves and we can add what we can and we can work hard. And uh, some of these conflicts, as we know, won't be um, able to be resolved in the fullness until the fullness of time is here. Okay, so just a few verses that have been encouraging to me. So let's uh, talk about, first of all, change. We are in one of the most um, destabilizing periods of time in my life and I think for all of our lives. I remember as we all do 9-11 uh, and the terrorist attacks and how all of a sudden, as psychologists call these flashbulb memories, you remember the world seemed turned upside down as for the first time in our history, at least on the main land, uh, we were uh, attacked. And, and I actually went to 9-11 and did some relief work there. Uh, and it seemed so everything was turned upside down. Well, COVID-19 has even gone deeper and more pervasive in its change. It has just simply thrown everything into chaos uh, at the deepest levels, far more personal in a sense than what happened with 9-11. Uh, there, there were 3,000 people that uh, roughly 3,000 people that were killed. The city was thrown into turmoil. And of course the nation was, uh, we now have um, several hundred thousand people who have died. And so the efforts to uh, address this have certainly made everything so chaotic. Let me uh, show you just a, uh, a, a bit about change that I've learned. And it comes from uh, Maslow, Abraham Maslow, a psychologist in the 50s. And you may know of this theory, but he had the hierarchy of needs. And what he said is that we have a hierarchy of needs and the most basic one is security. And so what we need most of all is that we will, we will try to find a way to be secure. And then once we are secure, and these are kind of my own words um, that I've used to adapt what he has said, is that we then need order. So if you think about it, if there's a tornado, uh, I was in Kansas for a while and I saw a tornado that hit, took out about half the town. And, uh, and the first thing, of course, that happens is people begin to rebuild houses and buildings, and then they begin to find some order at once they get the order. And what Maslow argues is that um, we then, once we have secured an order, then we can begin to work on relationships. Uh, but you can't really work on relationships if you don't know where you're gonna live and you don't know how you're gonna survive, you have to pay attention to those. And then once relationships are beginning to establish, then you can have self-esteem. You can begin to feel positive about what you're doing, about um, the relationships you have, and then at the top, he called self-actualization. I just call it meaning, search for meaning and purpose. Life makes sense. So when change happens, and this can be small change or large change, it can be happen when we move from home to go to school or when we go from one place to another, when we start a new job, things happen. The first thing is that we have our security uh, is turns into insecurity. So we feel insecure. And you know those days of going to a new place and you just have no idea what's going on. You feel uh, odd, you don't know where to go, you don't know who people are. Uh, the second thing that happens is you begin to feel chaos. Uh, things don't make sense, you don't know what the expectations are. And then you have, you feel disconnected from people, you don't know who your friends are, and you then have a lot of self-doubt, you sort of wonder about whether this is going to work out, and you're just certainly uncertain about the whole thing. That always happens. And if you can think about what happened with uh, COVID-19, it has really struck at the very deepest part of who we are because jobs 
by the millions seem to have uh, disappeared all of a sudden, not because people didn't want to work, but for a variety of reasons in order to get this thing under control, jobs were just simply, people were forced to not go to work. That created create all kinds of financial insecurities. And then what do we do? Schools, look at what happened with schools. How do we educate? It was, you remember those days back in March and April, May, it was so chaotic. Kids had to be home and we had to educate them at home and who was going to do it? We were disconnected from each other. Our relationships were severed. And this is one of the things that's the most devastating is that we couldn't see the people we love or the people that we depended on. So we had to rely on things like Zoom in order to connect with people, but you couldn't even go to church. You couldn't go to the places that were the normal places. And this has created all kinds of self-doubt and uncertainty. So as a nation, individually and as families, as organizations, as cities and states and as a nation. In fact, the pandemic has expanded this to the whole world, has this kind of insecurity, chaos, disconnectedness with a lot of self-doubt and uncertainty about what this is going to happen. Now, the good news is, of course, we know the vaccine is on the, on the horizon. And, uh, and so we may, they're saying maybe by next summer. But what the next step is, is this always happens uh, in life, is that there's a new normal that will develop. And the new normal will begin with a new sense of security. Now, life has never been the same since 9-11. We are now in a very different way of living. Uh, gone are the days when you could run to the airport, rush up to the plane at the last minute, it was pulling away and say, could you let me on? And they would say, okay, well, maybe we'll do that. Those days are gone. The uh, world is, functions differently, but we have developed a new uh, sense of security. And it, you will develop then a new order will develop a new way of doing things this is going to happen with education it's going to happen with jobs it could be that we will now work from home a lot more than we used to that some things that were forced on us to change we may actually say let's keep doing those things in time new relationships will develop and we'll again re-establish the old relationships we have as time goes on we'll again feel confident once again about who we are, and in one time in the future again, there will be a new sense of purpose and meaning in life. So this is the cycle. It happens when small ways, if you look at your own life and you go to a different church, when you go to a new town, uh, you're going to see that you move from this confidence in terms of stability to the, all the doubt, the disconnectedness, and then in time it settles down and you find yourself into a new time of, uh, of where life is making sense. So the context that we're in with 9-11 uh, is in the midst of that we're in the midst of that change right now and with that change the um, there's so much um, so much insecurity going on okay so that's enough about that and I'll move on now to talk a little bit about conflict itself so understanding conflict now what I'd like to do is to have you think about conflict in, an, in a different way Maybe you're already there. Maybe this will be new thoughts for some of you, and maybe it will be old. But I want to suggest, first of all, let's start with a definition. What is conflict? So using my fine uh, artistic ability, I have some slides. There we go. Conflict is, and I have two phrases or two words that I want to uh, define conflict. First of all, conflict is differences. So when we have conflict, we are going to discover that there are differences that exist. Now, here's an important point to make. Differences themselves are not conflict. Differences are just differences. So if you have two people in a car and one person loves to drive and one person does not love to drive at all, they kind of hate it, particularly if you're going around Philadelphia or you're going around New York, or you're going around a major area, some people just hate it. But if one person likes to drive and the other one doesn't, you've got a difference and that's not conflict, that's just a difference. So many differences in life, actually the differences are compatible and they can actually strengthen whatever the parts are so that you have a whole that is working well. Now what makes conflict conflict is that when the differences have tension with them. That's what conflict is, it's differences and these differences produce tension. So it's the tension part that really is the important part about conflict, differences plus tension. Now that seems, I hopefully, understandable to you and shouldn't be controversial. Now, I think this is a statement that I'll make that is uh, 
you know, I think we're all going to agree with conflict is everywhere. It's in the workplace. It is in church. It's in the states and nations. It is uh, wherever you find people together, you're going to find conflict. You're going to find differences that are creating tension. Now, here's what I would like to suggest uh, to you to think about. Why do we have conflict? And here's what I will say that I would like for you to think about. We have conflict because we're created in God's image. We have conflict because we're created in, in God's image. In other words, let me even push it a little farther and say it this way. Conflict is created by God. Now, that may be a new thought for you. And I don't think it's uh, heretical. I think this is to say that when God created a complex world, he created differences. And these differences inherently have tensions associated when you put people together. So over the centuries, the theologians um, have discussed what does it mean to be created in the image of God. And, and I've seen five different parts of what it means to be created in the image of God. One is that we're thinking beings. Now, we don't know all things, but we're thinking beings. But God has made us as thinking beings. We think different thoughts. You have your thoughts. I have my thoughts. We are feeling beings. So you have your feelings, and I have my feelings. You love some things. You don't love some things. I love some things. I don't love some things. We don't necessarily love or are disinterested or passionate about the same thing. In fact, it's always interesting to see what people are so passionate about, like what they give their time to. And it's very, very different things. And suddenly you stumble on a subgroup, a subculture, and you're completely amazed that people actually spend their time doing that. We are creative beings. So if I tell you, here's a sum of money, build a house. Your house you're going to build is going to probably be different than the house I'm going to build. The colors you're going to choose, the kind of windows you have, the way you're going to position the house, what you're going to do with landscaping is probably going to be different than mine. God has created us with the ability to create. We are social beings, and this is partly where conflict comes in, because we're not individuals who are walking through life alone. We need others. We enjoy being with others. So we put ourselves in this similar space. And the last thing is that we're spiritual beings. And when I think of spiritual beings, I think of search for meaning, for search for meaning and purpose. We're beings that God has made to make sense out of life. About the age two or three, kids begin to ask the question, why? And why do they ask why? They ask why because they want to know. They attach themselves to things, blankets and, and, and things. They're, they're, they're stuffed animals. They take meaning. All of us, they take meaning. If you put a road through a city and you have to tear down houses, you are going to find people who are greatly distressed because they loved their community. It meant something to them. So here's my point that I want to make, is that if God has created us as thinking, feeling, creative, social, and spiritual beings, it is inevitable that we are going to find that we have differences, and some of these differences are going to be, they're going to create some tension. So I want to say this, conflict, in my mind, is not sin. Conflict has a positive and useful purpose. Now, I don't know if this is a new thought for you, a new way to look at conflict, but I'm suggesting that conflict is not sin. It has a positive and useful purpose. Here's one way to look at conflict. Conflict is like hunger and thirst. They're uncomfortable sensations. We don't like to be hungry, and we don't like to be thirsty. They're designed by God. They're given to us by God because they motivate us to address biological needs. If we didn't have hunger pangs, and we didn't have thirst, we would not eat probably, and we would not drink, and we would die. So God, in his wisdom, says, I'm going to create the human being, and they're going to have a little sensation sometimes to say, it's time to eat, and it's time to drink. Now, what we eat and what we drink is a decision we can make, and we can eat, we can overeat, we can uh, drink, we can drink things that are healthy, we can drink things that are unhealthy. The hunger and thirst doesn't determine what we eat or what we drink. It just simply says to us, you need to get some nutrition. You need to get some liquids in your body or your body's not going to be able to function. 
So if we look at conflict in that way, we see that conflict is an uncomfortable sensation. I don't know that when I say that uh, conflict has a positive and useful purpose, it's to say that it's a fun place to be because the tension itself, like hunger and thirst, encourages us to pay attention to a relationship gap. So when you feel the tension, you understand that there is a gap between me and somebody and that should in its best moments call us to say, we need to talk, I think, because I'm sensing some tension in our relationship. So in that regard, that's why I would suggest if you begin to think of conflict as differences that create tension, and these are normal, it's natural, it is God ordained in a sense, in this sense, that we think, feel, act differently, and some of these are going to create tension. And now it says to us, you need to slow down, you need to take some time, you need to figure out what's going on, you need to resolve the tension. So in other words, conflict is inevitable. So if you came to this session hoping that you would uh, find a way to not have conflict, I'm actually gonna suggest the opposite. I'm gonna suggest conflict is inevitable and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now I use the word necessarily because I do want to acknowledge something that's very important in the middle of this. And that is my screen, there we go. Uh, there is an, also an uh, influence of the fall as well as that happens to the uh, differences in tension. So I don't want to say that uh, there is not uh, an element of sin in the, in the um, issues that emerge. Uh, there is. And so um, our thinking falls short. Uh, in fact, people can lie. Uh, they can distort. Uh, they can misrepresent. Uh, so thinking is something that God has given us the ability to do. And then we have the ability to distort. Feelings can get distorted. Uh, we can either hide feelings, we can exaggerate feelings, we, our feelings can be misdirected. Uh, so feelings can also be uh, not what God intended when God created feelings. Our creative impulses uh, can be misguided so that we can create things that are harmful. It always amazes to me of all the things that sort of remind me of the possibility of sin. It's when people create these uh, viruses uh, for computers. Why would anyone sit down and actually create something that would just simply be mean, nasty, and ugly to other people. Uh, but we have that ability to take something that God has given us and abuse it, misuse it. Social relationships can get twisted. And so we know that in a lot of relationships, with all of our relationships, we can look back and realize that we didn't love the way we should have loved. We didn't respond the way we should have responded. Uh, we play games. We do things that are actually destructive to other people. Uh, whether it's mild or whether it's a you know, serious kind of abuse that happens. Um, but God has given us the ability and to be socially interactive and the need to be socially interactive, we can twist it. And then finally, our spiritual quest uh, can go astray. So rather than follow God's plan for our life, we can do something that is uh, on our own and that can uh, go astray. So I don't want to suggest in any of this that there's not an element to sin in the whole world of conflict. But what I do want to suggest is that if you go back to the definition, conflict is differences that create tension. And, and that is a part of what it means to just simply be created in the image of God. So I want to ask this question. If conflict is natural and has a positive purpose, why do we dread it so much? If I had you all in front of me and you were on a continuum and I said, here's 10 at one end and one in the other, uh, how much do you, how, how positive is your experience with conflict be? Most of the time when I do this, people are down around two or three or four. It's like they really think ugly, it's been ugly. And why? And I would say it's not the difference that hurts. It's the painful things we do. I'm moving this out of my way here. It's the painful things we do to resolve the tension. When people feel tension, they can do some awful things to resolve the tension. It goes so far as to kill, to beat, to hit, to uh, shame, to do things that are very painful. And so when we think about conflict, we often are reminded of the painful things that somebody did to us when there was a tension and that attempt to resolve things was very painful. And so we do have these 
bad memories of conflict that was attempted to be resolved in a way that was very hurtful. So uh, cons destructive conflict separates and there is a destructive conflict type of conflict and there uh, we have those memories. But I also wanna to suggest to you that co constructive conflict can actually unite. That if we have attention and if we have take the time and if we have the skills to communicate and to work on this, and I hope this has happened to you at some point, I hope and at some point in your life, you can think back and say, you know, there was a time I had a, a real tension with a friend or a parent or a child and we sat down and we talked and we gained a much better understanding of each other. In fact, we are closer now than we have ever been. So conflict, the, the resolution of conflict can create pain and it can also unite us. So then what I'm suggesting to you here to think about is, that the goal is to not have no conflict, double negative there, but the goal is to not have no conflict. The goal is to transform conflict, bringing us closer to each other. So that's what I'm suggesting that we begin to understand that when we uh, see the tension around us, we realize there's, there are gaps around us and that should motivate us not to try to uh, not have the conflict, but actually find a way to deal with the conflict so that we can understand each other better and we can get closer to a solution that is a constructive solution and at least avoid doing things that are really painful and harmful to each other. And really bad things can happen. I think of the verse from Ephesians, be angry and sin not. The verse there does not say that do not be angry, but it recognizes that when we're in a state of anger, when we have the higher the anger is, the more intense the, uh, the fury is, the more prone we are to do things that are going to hurt other people. And so the passage there from Paul is to be angry and sin not. And I would say that applies to conflict. The goal is to actually not have no conflict, the goal is to have conflict and sin not. How do we find ways to bring ourselves together so that we are united in the outcome? So let's go back to COVID-19 just for a second because uh, COVID-19 has created new differences and added to the tensions. And so I just have listed some here, you know them just from your own life. We have employment tensions. We have families that are really struggling financially now. They don't know where their next meal, they don't know what they're gonna do. And this has been made worse because things like unemployment, now the Congress is having difficulty coming up with ways to help people. Um, we have the education tensions. It's just made life so difficult that all of a sudden you had your normal routines and now you're told your kids are gonna come home and you have to figure out how you're gonna care for them. You may or may not have to go to work. If you're at home, you're at home trying to do your work and you're trying to educate the children. The roles are getting overloaded. We have still the normal things of cleaning and, and getting groceries and buying things and, and all that takes place at a normal life. Now we have our work at home, we have our school at home, uh, we have our church, we can't even go to church and sit with other people and find the, uh, you know, the recovery time that comes with worship. The daily routines are now chaotic. Uh, we have too many bodies around us like normally somebody gets out of the house. So you have your own space. Now everybody's at home. And if you have a small home, you're on top of each other. And now as winter comes, it creates new tensions. And then the normal supports we have, going to see grandpa and grandma or seeing the grandkids or going to see friends or going out and doing things, going out to have a meal out, all the things we normally do to kind of keep our ship, you know, even keeled, those have been taken away from us. And so, what we're feeling right now is increased insecurity, increased chaos. Our relationships are stressed. We're not feeling good about ourselves. And we're asking ourselves, when is this ever going to end? So as we think about conflict in our current situations, let's be mindful of the fact that tensions are very high, that we are stressed as individuals. We are stressed as families. We are stressed as cities. We're stressed as states. We're stressed Politically, we're stressed all kinds of ways. And let's just begin as we think about conflict to recognize 
This is weary. Conflict may not be sin, but it sure does wear you out. And uh, when it's done poorly, when the tensions are done poorly, it actually adds to the pain that we feel in life. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, this. The problem is that few of us have learned how to handle conflict in a constructive way. I don't know what your models have been, but if you think about your own family, your own parents, how many times did you see differences that had tension? People sit down, talk, work through it in a way that actually came and brought them closer together. So few good examples. If you look at television, if you look at the role models we have, that are at least promoted in the media, we don't see so many opportunities to learn how to deal with tensions in a way that's actually constructive. We're desperate right now to figure out how we stop the polarization. How do we stop the polarization politically and get back to the point where we have some level of respect and ability to work together? We don't have so many good examples. So it's a long journey we're on and it's a complex journey that we're on and let's at least recognize that in COVID-19, we are in a situation with more than the average amount of conflict and tension. Is there reason to have hope? Can conflict really be constructive? When, uh, when you're worn out, you don't have much hope. Uh, you know, if you wake up in the morning after a good night's rest, you have a lot more hope than you do if you've gone through a tough day and at the end of that day, you kind of say, I don't know whether it's, we're ever going to be able to get out of this. Well, I want to have you take a little bit of a, let's take a little detour into the scripture for just a bit. Uh, this is the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob family. This is uh, something I did some time ago called a conflict genogram. The genogram is like a family tree. And I encourage you to do this. Go back, you know, start whatever Genesis 12 or about whatever you start reading about Abraham and you just read about this family. Now, this family is one fouled up family. The green on here are the strong relationships. The red are the conflicts. So as you know, we won't spend much time in this, but you know, there was a lot of tension with Hagar and Sarah and Abraham. A lot had their tensions. And then you get to Jacob and Esau and what a mess you know, that was. And Jacob, of course, had a really tough time with Laban. And then you've got Leah and Rachel. They got all kinds of things. And Laban and Rachel had tough things going on. And then the boys. This was a, a blended family, and they have lots and lots and lots of issues. So if you find that your family, you wonder if your family you know, has any hope for your family, well, just go back and read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. And you're going to say, well, at least I've, there are other people that are in difficult situations as well. And God used them. So if God used them, uh, I guess God can use us in our situation as well. So just a little bit about this, a little bit more. Conflict in the life of Jacob and Esau. Just think about the conflict. Jacob lies. He's deceitful. Yeah, Jacob steals a birthright and the blessing from his uh, Esau. Esau gets mad, so mad he's going to kill him. And of course, he's sent off to, uh, to his uncle's place because uh, Esau is going to kill him. And I, my guess is that he may well have uh, killed him. He, he was so furious. Very destructive. If you think about Joseph and his brothers, again, I, I don't, you know, I've tried to always figure out Joseph's motivation when he talked about the dreams and other kinds of things, but it certainly feels like there's a certain bit of taunting going on. I don't know if it was taunting or not, but the brothers, they really hated it. They decided to sell him. They were going to kill him. Very destructive. They did sell him. And as you know, the story of Joseph begins by his brothers selling him. So if you find that you have family tensions that are pretty tough, well, I say go back to scripture and be uh, comforted that Jacob and Esau had their moments and Joseph and his brothers. And here's why I want you to read these stories, because Jacob and Esau are beautifully reconciled. They are the most beautiful stories of finally deciding they wanted to come together. And you have Jacob who's shaking in his boots and he's got all the animals to try to go to Esau and say, I'm sorry. And he wants to give him all these gifts. And there comes Esau with all these men and we have what appears to be, in Jacob's eyes, a big battle. And Jacob just embraces him and said, no, I don't need your animals. Uh, I don't need them. And they have a wonderful uh, reconciliation. And Joseph and his brothers, what a wonderful, wonderful story of Joseph, who finally recognizes his brothers when they get down to Egypt. And he plays a few games with them. He tests them. And then you have him crying out. He is so so happy to finally be reunited with his brothers and to get to see his dad and his brother, Benjamin, again. 
they are wonderful stories. So as you think about conflict in your own life, uh, you can recognize that God has been working throughout history with people in difficult situations, and you can see that there's some wonderful stories about reconciliation. Okay, so we need to, uh, here's a, uh, we don't have much time yet, but I want to ask you this question. Uh, where did Joseph get the strength and vision to move conflict from being destructive to constructive? I want you to think about this. I think it had to do with his family. Do you know that Joseph was just a baby when Jacob and Esau were reunited? Don't you think that Jacob said to Joseph over and over and over again, he told the story of the time that Uncle uh, Esau forgave me. Don't you think that when Joseph saw his brothers, he had a, a, a memory of the time that forgiveness was paramount? Don't you think that maybe they knew the stories of Jacob, of Abraham and Isaac, of God's grace? Don't you think they knew the stories of Hare and Ishmael, where God intervened, where reconciliation took place? Don't you think that they remembered Noah and the stories of Noah and God found grace? So what I want to suggest to you is that we need to find the stories of love and forgiveness and reconciliation. We need to tell them. We need to hear them. We need to be reminded that bad things do happen. Conflict can be horrible, but conflict can be um, inspiring. It hasn't happened. We need to hear those stories. So as you have them, tell them. As you around people, try to find them. When did they ever find conflict and how did they resolve it? Okay, we've got a few more minutes yet. So I'm not going to make life easy for all of us. There are not one way to resolve conflict, there are five. There's my way, your way, no way, halfway, and we agree. So if there's a tension, what we need to do is to figure out what is the wise way to resolve this issue. Should we do it your way? Should we do it my way? Can we compromise? Should we just set it aside and say, we're not going to deal with this, or should we actually find and can we find a way to agree? Now, all of these I'm going to suggest to you, there's a time and a place. There's a time and a place to sit down and talk and find an agreement that actually everybody's 100% happy with. Compromise says we will settle with less than 100%, but there's a time and a place for that. There's a time and a place for you to say to somebody, I love you so much, I want you to do it your way. Don't worry about me. There's a time and a place if it's very important for you to say, this is very important to me and it is wonderful if other people will go your direction and say, sure, let's do it your way. And there's a time and a place for you to say, let's just stop and deal with this later. So where do we begin? You need to have a positive and hopeful attitude Relax, slow down, and approach the tension with a positive attitude. Know that conflict doesn't have to be horrible. Don't run from it. Don't assume that because there's tension, bad things are going to happen. Develop skills to make them so that they can be positive. Be patient. Conflict can be very complicated. Pick the right time and the right place. We've all seen situations in the grocery store where it was not the right time, it was not the right place to have that conversation. Like there are some times to say we need to be uh, wait and, and come back to this, but do make sure you come back to it or things will mushroom. There's this wonderful verse in uh, James. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's great advice for us to follow. So I'm going to suggest we have used triple respect when you are moving into conflict. Here's this passage you know. This is the most important hero is of the Lord your God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is love your neighbor is yourself. No other command is greater than these. Three kinds of respect. First of all, move into conflict with a respect for God, a respect for the other, and a respect for self. This will give you humility. It will give you the ability to give to others and allow them to win some or get some. And self-assertiveness is important. Assertiveness is not aggression. Assertiveness just means that you understand that God has a plan for you and it, your thoughts and feelings are equally important. Now, how you resolve issues is up to the two of you to decide. So respect, I won't go through this for the sake of time. I'll just show you uh, this, that there is high respect for me. And I, what I will say to you is if 
all of these, if there's high respect, if you have to have your way, you say, I insist, but I explain, I am sorry. If you go into forcing or my way with respect, it's not going to be destructive. If you say to somebody, let's do it your way, and you do it out of strength, it won't be destructive. If you say, let's just wait until later, uh, and you do it openly and intentionally, it doesn't need to be destructive. On the other hand, if you ever say, I insist, and I don't care what you think, we're in a bad situation. If you ever say, I will make you decide because I don't believe in myself, we've got an outcome that's not going to be all that healthy. If you say, we don't bring up things because it's not worth the hassle, that's going to blow up at some point, at least if you're in an ongoing relationship. And if you compromise out of weakness, you're going to find that this is really not very satisfying. So respect is critical. Respect for yourself, respect for the other. And I say as a Christian, we should all be understanding that we are following God's plan for our life. It's not our life. It's not our decision. It's decisions that we make to the honor and glory of God, which should give us humility and some flexibility. I'll say this, a couple more things yet. Use effective communication, something I call speak and listen. You have got to learn to communicate effectively. Uh, one person speaks, one person listens and restates. Take turns. Explain what you're thinking and feeling, but do not argue and keep your voice down and do not interrupt. Uh, one of the things that we just have got to learn to do better is to how to have positive communication when we feel tension. And when we feel tension, often we lose the ability to listen and we just begin to want to speak. And the more we want to speak, the louder we get, the more animated we get. We stand up, we begin to walk around. And sometimes in order to be heard, people will smack and they will hit because they want to make a point and that becomes very destructive. Be positive in problem solving. Work as much as you can to agree. Consider compromises if possible. Watch for my way, your way patterns over time and work for balance. If you get your way all the time, somebody's going to get resentful or they're gonna just simply lose interest in the relationship. If you give all the time, at some point you're gonna be resentful. So you need to find over the long term how you can connect with people so that everybody feels invested, they feel heard, and sometimes they get what's important to you and wherever you can, see if you can find solutions that are going to work. And then allow some things time to be set aside. Uh, there are some really complicated situations that you just have to realize this is going to take some time in order to figure out. And get someone to help if you get stuck or things get destructive. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to have somebody outside the relationship get involved so that you can each be yourself and if you don't have great skills with communication, particularly when under tension, somebody can help make sure that this is, uh, doesn't get destructive. If you find you try to resolve things and they don't get destructive, the temp if they get destructive, the temptation is to never do it again. That doesn't really resolve issues. It just sets up things to get problematic later. So sometimes you might need to get somebody help. It can be a professional or it can be somebody that just knows how to, to mediate in a way that uh, they just have natural skills. Finally, I'll say this, pray for wisdom with Solomon. Uh, I love the story of Solomon uh, in 1 Kings 3, uh, where he is just a boy and he says, and now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And I think that's how we often feel about conflict. We don't know even where to get started. And that's what Solomon was, I think, feeling here is I don't even know how to do this. And so his prayer was, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. What he wanted was wisdom. He prayed for wisdom. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. So as you move into difficult tension situations, uh, I think as lifelong Christians, we should be praying that God would teach us how to be peacemakers and give us the wisdom. I don't know this is true theologically, but in my mind, I can imagine that Solomon, when he had to make that decision about the baby and the two mothers, who, the two women who said they were the mother, and he threatened to uh, cut the baby in half, that came after years of experience. He was insightful and he was wise. I rather doubt in my mind that he did that as a young child, that he had that ability to discern. Maybe so, but uh, I think our prayer can be uh, to God that we become wise in knowing how to communicate 
how to bring these things out in the open so we can talk about them and then have the wisdom to know how we do things that are either your way, my way, halfway, no way, or our way. Gwen, I need to stop. Our, our time is up. Uh, so I will uh, see if anybody has any questions. That's a topic I love to talk about. And so I got to stop or I would just go right on all afternoon. <laughs> yes, very good, Lawrence. That was very good. We do have... Um... A question that has come through the chat, and we also have questions that came in on the registration form. Form, So we're going to start with those questions. And please feel free to submit any questions that you have, and we will answer as many of them as we can. Uh, the question that has come through the chat, Lawrence, this past week, I saw a manager at a Christian nonprofit store berate a woman who was unable to wear a mask due to an obvious medical condition as he forced her out of the store. This has burdened my heart. How do we approach other Christians when the fear of COVID creates conflict that causes us to forget that even when people disagree, we are all God's creation that he loves very much. Yeah, that's, that's such a, a, a sad example, isn't it? Of kind of what I was saying is that there was obviously a difference and there was a tension. And in the effort to resolve the tension, the manager used rather poor strategy to try to get the point that was that that he or she wanted to make. Uh, so I think we can begin by just recognizing when we are experiencing tension, we like Paul says about anger, we are susceptible to say things that are not very, uh, they're, they're not kind, they're not godly, they're not helpful, they're, they're hurtful. And you can just imagine that the person who was berated is still suffering. Uh, this, this incident will be reminded. I'll bet you that you all can remember times where you were dressed down and it lasts for a long, long time. So um, one thing that I see is that I just think this is a good example of how predisposed we can be to do painful things. Uh, when we have good intentions, the effort was a good effort. The concern was a good concern. So we can recognize that in other people. Now, what I also am interested in here is that this, what you saw created for you attention for yourself. And now the question is, I feel this tension. What do I do with this tension? And so in a sense, you have to apply to yourself the very thing that you would want for the other person, which is if you were to have at that point, jumped into that situation and pointed your finger at the manager and said, this is inappropriate and you would have called names and you would, we see these things, you would actually be doing the same thing. So we need to find ways to find the right time, find the right place uh, and, and make it a constructive thing so that you would listen. The whole mediation and conflict resolution starts by having people tell their stories. You simply begin to say to somebody, tell me what you were thinking, tell me what you're feeling, Tell me what led you to do this. And what you may discover is what was inside of them. That may give you then an opportunity to say, well, I'll tell you how it made me feel. You could then begin to share what you're feeling. And then the two of you together would say, what do you think we should do? And it could be that the manager would say, uh, you know, here's what I think we should do. Or maybe there's some solution. But uh, I think we see that how people, particularly when we're tired, when we have lost our patience, we say things that are painful that we would never say when we're calm. One of the tests that I, I am, am familiar with, a, 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 one of these personality kind of tests about conflict, has you evaluate your conflict style when you're calm and when you're under pressure. And when we're under pressure, we do things differently than when we're calm, which is partly to say, make sure you're in the right time or place before you say it. Don't necessarily stuff it and never do it, just make sure you're in the right time or place. Very good. The next question, how can I talk to elementary school age children about conflict? And what methods might I use to walk these kids through the change, through change? Oh, you know, there's a whole big powerful, you should look, at, look into the whole, there's a lots and lots of stuff out there about schools using conflict uh, mediation, conflict transformation techniques. There are schools that actually, as the school, they use um, peer mediation where the kids themselves are gonna sit down and there's a, very, there's a very structured process used with mediation. It starts with storytelling 
you make sure that each person has a chance to tell their side of the story, and then you identify the problems, and then you try to individually deal with the problems, and you see if you can come up with a solution. And there are schools that actually have kids who are leading this, so they can be trained to uh, speak and listen. They can be trained to set up a process or to have individuals who are going to be the mediators so that two people who are having difficulty um, can um, make sure they get a chance to share. Now, one of the things that people need, everybody needs the ability to be heard. And often when we are heard, and it's heard not just what we think, but what we feel. If our feelings can be acknowledged, we somehow then can relax a little bit and then we can get down to the issues. So kids can be taught these uh, skills. There's a whole process called the circle process. It's a very simple process uh, that you can use where you have sometimes a talking stick or something and you go around and each person gets a chance to share what they're feeling. And they can be powerful opportunities for people to number one, say what they wanna say. And secondly, they get a chance to hear things. When we get to an argument, we generally uh, speak and don't listen. And if you listen to a really powerful argument, nobody's listening. They already are way ahead. They already know their next two or three points they want to make, and they're only watching for somebody to take a breath, or they get louder and stand up or try to force themselves into the situation. So kids can learn this, and I would encourage you to look some, for some material about peer mediation in schools. Lots and lots of really great stuff. Very good, Lawrence, because one question also was, do you provide any post-webinar resources for parents and teachers? You know, we can talk about that. I don't have anything on my uh, schedule right now to do that way, but uh, certainly this is a topic that I love to talk about. And so however I can be helpful, I'm happy to see if I can, can be involved. Okay, excellent. Uh, how does isolation fuel conflict? Or does it just lead to apathy? Yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes we need to get away. Um, mm -hmm. Conflict requires two people. What's interesting, of course, about conflict and tensions is these tensions can actually be tensions that go way back to our childhood. They never got resolved. Sometimes what's happened is that things happen in the past, stay with us, with us in the present. And they actually, when we're talking to you, I'm actually in my mind thinking about a thing that happened 30 years ago and I'm responding to attention. So sometimes, um, being alone means that you're not in with other people. And so that by virtue of the fact you're not with other people, at least you're not going to have a, uh, a current uh, conflict that's active in its difference and tension. But in our heads, though, we still have memories and we still have relationships. And so um, what happens sometimes when we're alone is that we begin to uh, have lower self-esteem. And if you have low self-esteem, you have more difficulty dealing with construct, conflict constructively because you're not able to share what you think uh, or what you feel because you don't have the, uh, the energy to sort of be truthful about where you're at in a tactful way or in a constructive way. So it can go either way, uh, but sometimes what we need to do with uh, in motor and conflict is we need to remove ourselves from the situation so that we're not at least going to say or do anything harmful at that point. If you remove yourself from the situation, just be careful that you don't um, not deal with it. And then the next time it happens, you're a little bit more mad and maybe you remove yourself. And the next time you're a little bit more mad still. And at some point you finally can't take it. And then you have the abuse cycle. The abuse cycle tends to people who avoid, 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 then they blow up and you have this big volcano and lots and lots of bad things happen. And then there's a lot of regret. And then they go back to avoid, 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 explode. So at some point, if you are uh, removing yourself, which may help you keep from um, doing things that are painful and destructive at that moment, you will need to at some point find a way if this is an ongoing relationship, if it's a, if it's a traffic incident and you're never gonna see the person again, then just you know, let it go. Uh, but if you're a person you deal with on a regular basis, you may need to find a time to begin to say, can we talk? And, uh, and then you do storytelling. You tell your story and you listen and you paraphrase to make sure you understand. Uh, that at least get the issues out there. Then you have to get to the hard part to say, okay, what do we do about it? And as I've said, there are five things you can do about it. You can work to agree. You can compromise. You can say, can we do it my way? 
And if both of you agree, that's a great solution. You can say, let's do it your way. That's a great solution. You can say, let's just um, talk about it, you know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So let's get back. Uh, when my wife and I got married, we decided we were going to let some things go until we were 50 to resolve because we figured they were going to take that long. So we uh, don't try to solve everything, but we try to solve a lot of things. And as uh, you know, the scriptures are pretty clear. Take care of your anger before the sun goes down. That's all about trying to keep it current so that you don't let these things pile up. Yes, yes, very good. We have time for one more question, Lawrence. Um, we received quite a few questions about how to deal with people who don't take COVID-19 seriously. So there's a specific question that says, what advice would you give for people living at home with loved ones who are not taking this pandemic seriously? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, so I'll go back to what I talked about in a sense. You need to start with respect. You need to understand that um, each person has a reason. And, and so make sure you go into that situation with respect for the person to say, look, you're, you know, I respect your ability to make the decision, your own decisions. Then you need to listen. Uh, so often we're interested in telling people what we want them to know about us. And very often what we need to do is we need to listen. We need to sit down in a place where we can say, can we talk about this? Tell me what you are seeing and why you're doing what you're doing. Gain the deepest understanding that you can about why they are doing what they are doing. And if it's a good constructive conversation, then you get a turn to say, well, here's what I think about this. Don't use I messages or attacking messages. It's you're sharing kind of how you see the world. Put those two side by side. And then what do you learn? Maybe you're gonna discover that you actually agree on a lot of things. Maybe the difference is just about a few things. Or maybe it's they're dealing with not really COVID. Maybe they're dealing with other issues that come to mind. And when they don't wear a mask, it's not about the mask. It's about some symbol. Maybe if you can understand that and you can come to some kind of agreement to say, is there any way we can agree? There are some situations that people disagree with. And what you want to do is to not make this destructive. So gain understanding, see what you can learn. And then together, if you have a relationship that's constructive, you begin to say, well, what do you think we should do? And see if together you can come up with a solution. And maybe what you're going to find is they'll agree to do it under circumstances, these circumstances. And maybe you have to say, OK, I understand you're taking a risk in some other situations. Uh, but keep the relationship uh, important. Keep the respect important. And uh, see if you can make some progress on it. Mm. Very good, Lawrence. I would love to continue, but we're just about out of time for today. Before we leave, I wanted to I want to thank Lawrence for a very helpful and informative presentation and for his time today. We'll be sending you a link of today's webinar in a follow-up email, and we encourage you to share it with anyone you think would benefit from the content. I want to also put a plug in for our Master of Social Work program. Karen launched this fall. The MSW program is a fully online christ Senate program that prepares advanced level social workers for grace-driven, relationship-based practice with individuals and families. Lawrence is an excellent example of the caliber of faculty our social work students study under. If you would like to learn more about the MSW program or any of our other graduate programs, you can visit our website to learn more or email admissions at caring.edu to speak with one of our counselors. We're also currently enrolling for Karen's graduate programs for this upcoming spring se semester, which starts January the 11th. If you're considering furthering your education or interested in auditing a class, inquire today or email the same email address to connect with one of our counselors. We are so grateful that you were able to be a part of today's webinar. We hope that this time has been very helpful for you. And we look forward to having you join us the next time. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.